Welcome back to the Yinjin War. I'm Samuel Hawley. In this episode, the Japanese advance on China has ground to a halt, and Hideyoshi's daimyo commanders are setting to work subjugating Korea. We're going to be focusing in particular on Kato Kiyomasa's campaign to pacify Korea's northeastern province of Hamgyong. Kato's thirst for glory would take him all the way north to the Tumen River and into Manchuria, actually into the outer reaches of the Ming Chinese Empire. That's coming up. Before we get going, please support my channel by subscribing and giving this video a thumbs up if you like it. And to all of you already subscribed, thank you. Okay, so to get us back into the story, here's the lay of the land in late summer, 1592. The Japanese have made it as far as Pyongyang, within 250 kilometers of the Yalu River in China. They occupy that city and the Chosung capital of Seoul and a number of towns further south, all the way back to their Pusan beachhead. Down on the south coast, the Korean Navy under Lee Sun Shin has blocked the Japanese Navy from entering the Yellow Sea. This means that the Japanese can't ship reinforcements and supplies north to strengthen their forward units in Pyongyang. And without those reinforcements, the advance on China can't continue. The invasion of Korea has therefore ground to a halt. With the conquest of China at least temporarily on hold, the Japanese turned their attention to securing their hold on Korea. Here's how the task was divided. In the south, Fukushima Masanori would take care of Kyongsang province, and Kobayakawa Takakage would deal with Chola. In central Korea, Kangwon province went to Mori Yoshinari and Shimazu Yoshihiro, and Seoul and Gyeonggi province to Ukita Hideye. In the north, Kuroda Nagamasa was responsible for Huanghe province and Konishi Yukinaga for the southern half of Pyongyang province, up to the furthest point of advance at Pyongyang. That left the northeastern province of Hamgyong. It's been assigned to Kato Kiyomasa and the 20,000 men of his second contingent. After crossing the Imjin River in July and helping take Kaesong, Kato separated from the main body of the Japanese army and turned northeast toward Hamgyong. Kato had in fact gotten lucky in being assigned this province. Of Korea's eight provinces, Hamgyong was the most resentful of Chosun dynasty rule and the central bureaucracy in Seoul, which seemed to treat the province like the ox of Korea to be whipped for food and taxes, but otherwise ignored. Hamgyong was also the Siberia of Korea, the place where political undesirables were sent into exile. So when Kato and his second contingent show up, a lot of the local people are ready to turn on their own leaders. When the province's southern army commander flees in the face of Kato's advance, it's local Koreans who run him down and kill him. The fleeing governor of Hamgyong is also captured by his own people and turned over to the Japanese. Kato made it to the provincial capital of Hamhong without encountering any resistance. Here, he divided his force in two, leaving half his men behind to garrison the town while he continued north to subdue the rest of the province. Finally, around Kilchu, the Koreans at last make a stand, organized by the province's northern army commander, Han Guk Ham. Han has summoned the garrisons from up near the Tumen River that guard Korea from incursions by Jurchen tribesmen in Manchuria. 
This Korean force, which included disciplined cavalry units, puts up a tough fight and forces the Japanese to take shelter in a grain storage facility behind barricades of rice bales. Then Han makes a mistake. Overconfident, he orders an immediate attack. Kato's men beat the Koreans back with musket fire and drive them into retreat. Later that night, Kato and his men silently encircle Han's camp and attack. They leave just one avenue of escape open, leading into a swamp. When it's all over, almost the entire Korean force is wiped out. Commander Han himself manages to get away, but he's captured by locals and turned over to Kato. From Kilchu, Kato continued north all the way to the Tumen River, capturing Korean frontier forts and mopping up any lingering resistance. When he arrived at Horyong, he's delighted to receive a present. Two of King Sonjo's sons, Prince Sunhua and Prince Imhe, are handed over to him. At the start of the war, when Seoul was being evacuated, King Sonjo had sent these two of his sons east into Kangwon province, while he himself fled north to Weiju with the crown prince his intention being to disperse the royal bloodline to ensure its survival. As Kato's second contingent swept through Kangwon and up into Hamgyong province, princes Sunhua and Imhe were forced to retreat further and further north, all the way to Horyong, where they're seized by a turncoat government official named Guk Kyong In. Turning the princes over to Kato, was Guk's show of allegiance. Kato immediately had the young man untied, and he reprimanded Guk for treating the princes so poorly. During their captivity with Kato, princes Sunhua and Imhe will be treated well. Hamgyong province now belonged to Kato, or so it seemed. The population was passive. Assessment rolls were being prepared and taxes would soon start rolling in. The province was being set up to run like a domain back in Japan. Now, any other Japanese commander would probably have kicked back at this point and taken a break. But not Kato, Hideyoshi's most gung-ho commander. He continues north across the Tumen River into Manchuria, actually into the outer reaches of China's empire, to take on the vaunted Jurchen tribesmen and test them in battle. He would do so with 8,000 of his own men, reinforced by 3,000 Koreans. Now, we need to stop here for a moment to fully appreciate the size and weight of Kato Kiyomasa's steel balls. From the starting point of the invasion back in Japan, Kato has led his men a massive distance. The equivalent of, say, from New York to Miami. He's passed through hostile territory for most of the way, traveling on little more than rough paths, and he's had to fight numerous battles. And now here he is, 2,000 kilometers or more from home, crossing into Manchuria to pick a fight with the Jurchen, because he just wants to test them, and more importantly, test himself. Is this an interesting character or what? It's no wonder that Kato would be such a popular subject for later woodblock artists in the Tokugawa and Meiji eras. Many prints would be produced of him battling the Koreans and the Chinese, and most popular of all, hunting tigers in northern Korea with his distinctive three-pronged spear. Kato nearly got himself killed in Manchuria, fighting the Jurchen. The campaign began successfully with the capture of a Jurchen fortress. This is a woodblock print showing Kato's men rolling a boulder down onto the fortress to smash through the back wall. After that, Kato's Korean allies went home, leaving him alone to face the Jurchen counterattack when it came. 10,000 tribesmen versus 8,000 Japanese. 
After cutting off a vast number of heads, Kato fell back across the Two Men River under the cover of a rainstorm, back to the relative safety of Korea. This next image shows Kato and his men on the northern coast of Korea immediately after the Jurchen campaign. They're gazing out across the sea toward Japan, mesmerized by what appears to be a hazy view of Mount Fuji on the horizon. Kato settled down in the town of Anbyong after that, with the two Korean princes as his guests. He wrote to Hideyoshi in late October 1592 that he had so completely subdued Hamgyong province that there wasn't even a whisper of rebellion. But his boasting was premature. The Koreans of Hamgyong had been an easy conquest because they didn't like their own leaders. But that didn't mean they liked the Japanese. Far from it. The Japanese occupation of Hamgyong with its swaggering samurai and summary executions, with Japanese soldiers treating Koreans badly and taking whatever they wanted, it all caused resentment. And that, in turn, fueled resistance. Koreans who had sided with the Japanese were the first target of this growing backlash to foreign occupation in Hamgyong. The most notable victim was Guk kyung in the turncoat government official who had turned the two Korean princes over to Kato. For this act of betrayal, Guk was beaten to death. These Korean civilians who resisted the Japanese occupation, we looked at them previously in Episode 8. They were called the Weebyong, the Righteous Armies. In the next episode, we're going to take a look at a second guerrilla group, that arose in response to the invasion. They were called Sungbyong, monk soldiers. That'll be next time. See you then.